I'll tell you, I love things that are consistent. I love to go to restaurants where I know that the service and the food will always be good, not just once in a while, but consistently. Uh, I love to drive cars that are consistent. For most of Gina and I's marriage, we have driven Toyotas and Hondas because they're always reliable and we love them. I think it has to do with our childhood. Gina's first car was a Hyundai Excel. And back in the day, they used to catch on fire all the time. She said, Ryan, I knew it was going to be a lemon when I drove home uh, off the lot. I drove the car home and there were two cars, the same make and model, on fire on the road on the way home. I knew it was going to be bad. I love reliability. I love reliability. I love sports teams that are reliable. Now, my teams don't have to win the championship like every single season, but they, they at least need to be in the hunt. They need to be, like, competitive, right? Nobody wants to cheer for the team that's always in last place. I like friends that are reliable, people that I can count on. And I know you do, too. <clears throat> you know, consistency is one of the greatest things, and it's one of the greatest aspects of being a spiritually mature person is that ability to be consistent day in and day out. This morning I want us to look at Hebrews chapter 11 verse 5 at a man who embodied consistency. In fact, he was consistent for a long, long, long time. His name was Enoch. And Enoch walked with God, the Bible says, for 300 years. Wow, you want to talk about consistent, man. 300 years. Can you remember, can you imagine all of the prayers and all of the climactic moments that somebody must have had if they walked with God for 300 years? And Enoch is regarded in the Bible as the man who walked with God. He was, he was consistent. Look, look with me, if you would, in Hebrews 11:5. By faith, Enoch was taken away... So he did not experience death, and he was not to be found, because God took him away. For uh, prior to his transformation, he was approved, having pleased God. Now last week, or actually two weeks ago, we started this series called You're a Champion. And we're talking about being champions of faith. Uh, in week one, we talked about how faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of the things that are not seen. And last week we built on that by looking at the very first character, the very first person that's mentioned in this long listing of individuals and groups of people that operated by faith. And the first person was a man by the name of Abel. And Abel was a rancher who brought his offerings to God. He was a man of worship and God commended him. And we looked at his story and his example for us. And today I want to turn our attention to the second individual that's mentioned in this long list of spiritual faith champions. And his name is Enoch. And Enoch's probably a guy that you haven't heard a lot about uh, because the Bible doesn't speak about Enoch a whole lot. We only know about him from a few verses of the Bible. And when the Bible speaks about Enoch, it's very brief. But what the Bible says about him is very powerful and interesting at the same time. And I want us to look at this great character of faith and why the writer of Hebrews commends him as being an individual filled with faith. And, and, and the truth is he was just a man of great consistency. And I want us to be people of great faith and great consistency. So how can we express ourselves in a consistent faith? The first area we see is we have to walk with God. If we're going to have a consistent faith, we got to have a consistent walk, a, a regular walk, uh, not a walk with God that is on one moment and, <clears throat> and is off the next moment. We, we have to walk with God. And when the Bible speaks of walking, it, it, it really refers to our lifestyle. So to walk with God means to live a faith-filled lifestyle. And that's why Galatians 5.16 says we ought to walk in the Spirit. 
And when we walk with God, we get in step with God, we get on the agenda of God, we, we, we get in sync with God, and that is God's purposes, God's plans, God's objectives, God's destiny for our lives. To walk with God means that we have to hear from God, and when we hear from God, we respond accordingly, and we walk according to the divine cadence and pace that God has put before us. That's what it means to walk with God. God. Now, if you go back to Genesis chapter 5, verse 22 to 24, we see a little more commentary on the life of Enoch. And Enoch was a contemporary of Adam and Eve. He was born obviously after them, but he lived during the same time. We're talking like many, many, many years ago. And Enoch was a, a man that lived before the flood of Noah. And Genesis chapter 5 is kind of a funny chapter of the Bible because if you read the whole thing, it's like so-and-so lived a bunch of years and then he died. And then he lived a bunch of years and then he died. So the theme of Genesis 5 is that people die, okay? But what's interesting about the life of Enoch is that Enoch is the one person in the Bible that never died. Or actually, one of two people. Elijah and Enoch never died. God just took them into heaven. And I believe the reason that God just took Enoch was because he walked so intimately with God. It was like he was so close to God. One day he was walking with God and God just said, Hey, Enoch, why don't you come on over to my house tonight? And they never saw him again. <laughs> and he just walked with God. He walked with God. I wonder what the commentary on your life would be. Uh, if, if somebody just said, you know, I want to describe her, I'm going to describe him in maybe one sentence, what would people say? Would they say he was a great business leader? Would they say she was beautiful? Would they say um, she was a really nice person? Would they say uh, he was a good citizen? Or would they say they just walked with God? He just walked with the Lord. Just walked with him. Look with me here at Genesis 5, 22. Enoch walked with God, and after that he fathered Methuselah 300 years. <clears throat> and he had other sons and daughters. So being a parent made Enoch religious. Amen. Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So he walked with God for 300 years. It's a long time. That's a lot of walking with God. He had his first kid at age 65. That's when he started walking with God. You could say Enoch might have been just a little bit of a late bloomer. But you know, isn't it great that Enoch started walking with God at age 65? Did you know it's never too late for God to do something great in your life? You never get to like the age where it's like oh, God can't do anything. Right? We've had people in our church give their lives to Christ at 70 plus, 75 years old, maybe older than that. Man, you may be 80 or 90 years old. I don't know how old you are. But listen, it's never too late for God to do something great in your life. Never let yourself go down the, the path of believing that just because you have made this mistake or that mistake that God cannot move in your life. Enoch started a little late, but when he got on the path... He was in the zone for 300 years. He walked with God. What was his secret? What did he do? What was his life like? How did he have that, that capacity? <clears throat> um, Enoch, it never says he was the smartest. It never says he had the biggest biceps. It never says he was the most athletic. It doesn't say he was voted most likely to succeed by his high school graduating class. The Bible says this, he walked with God. Enoch was never swallowed by a great fish like Jonah. He never walked on the water like Jesus. He never parted the Red Sea like Moses. He never survived the lions did like Daniel. But he did one thing. He walked with God. You know, we talk so much about change in our culture. Books on change. Conferences on change. I preach on change. There's a place and a time for change. But did you also know that there's a time and a place to just stick with what you're doing? To just keep doing what you're doing? To just stay on the path that, that you've been on? Getting up every morning, spending some time in prayer and, and opening the Word of God and letting God speak to you and just being faithful and consistent in the church 
coming to church even when you're tired or when you're discouraged or even when you don't feel like coming to worship. You just come anyway. There, there's just something to be said for just doing what you're doing. Just keep with the stuff. Don't, don't, don't give up. Don't, don't be the kind of Christ follower that's like on one moment and then off another moment. This is the life of Enoch. He just walked with God 300 years 300 years and it was incredible David was known as the man after God's own heart Abraham was the friend of God Elijah was the man of God but Enoch was the man who walked with God now when people read this passage they generally think well how do people live to be so old in the Bible right there's some old people in the Bible I don't know if you've checked it out but there's some old timers in the Bible Read those early chapters of the book of Genesis. How do people live so long? Well, biblical commentators believe that there's a couple of different reasons why this may have been the case. One may be that God simply allowed people to live longer to help populate the earth because there were obviously very few people here in the beginning. And maybe people lived longer to populate the earth. Others believe that perhaps the environment changed during the time of the flood of Noah. Uh, and if you, if you look at it and you read the book of Genesis, you see before the flood of Noah that people live longer. And after the flood of Noah, people live shorter. And so many believe that there were some environmental changes and some different things that happened to the earth during that time that caused people to live shorter or longer lives. Um, some others have even said that, that the human race may have been more genetically pure um, at that time. But whatever the reason is, the Bible is very clear that people live to be very old. Uh, now, when, we, when we, we read about Enoch, it's easy to think, well, maybe he walked with God because, because like back in the Bible days, everybody just kind of did right. Like, you know, I mean, all the women wore skirts down to their ankles and put their hair in a bun. And everybody spoke in those and thous. And there was no Internet. And people just, you know... Read Genesis chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8. People were wicked. The reason that God sent the flood of Noah right after this is because of the sin of the people. I mean, Enoch lived in a wheels-off world. You think we live in a crazy place. Read about the time of Enoch and Noah. People were violent. People were immoral. People were crazy. People had lost their mind. And it grieved the heart of God. That's why he sent the flood in the first place. God did so slowly, and He did so uh, after many, many years of being merciful, but ultimately He did. So Enoch, it wasn't easy for Enoch to walk with God. We, we can't just sit here and go, well, that was easy for him, but you don't know the world I live in. Listen, Enoch lived in a wheels-off place. And if Enoch can walk with God, I know that you can walk with God. I know you work with some tough people. I know you got some challenging relationships around you that may suck the life out of you. But remember this, you can walk with God. When you want to walk with God, you can walk with God regardless of what's going on. And so walking with God always implies relationship. Uh, if you're not walking with God, you're walking away from God. It's one or the other. And notice he did not walk ahead of God and he did not walk behind God. He simply walked what? With God. Yeah, he walked with God. He, he got in step with the Spirit. He got in step with the direction that the Lord was taking him. <clears throat> um, I think one of the greatest areas where we need to walk with God is in the marriage. Uh, I don't know if you notice this, but men and women are different. Can somebody say amen? Is that true? Men and women are different, aren't they? <clears throat> I was in the car a few weeks ago with my wife, and she was like, I was like, honey, what are you doing? She said, I took off my shoes. And I said, why'd you take your shoes off? She says, my shoes hurt my feet. And I was like, well, if the shoes hurt your feet, why did you buy them? She said, because they're cute. They were cute shoes. They, they match my outfit. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I have never bought a pair of shoes. And I am a shoe guy. And those of you that know me know that I'm telling the truth. I'm a shoe guy, but I have never bought a pair of shoes that hurt my feet. It doesn't matter how good they look, right? There's a different criteria, isn't there? You know, 
It's a different criteria. A, f- a few years ago, somebody in the church gave me a really nice, fat recliner. I mean, it, this has man cave written all over it. It had the big drink holder. It was a beautiful, soft leather like material. It was oversized like for one and a half persons. And when I saw it, my, I began to salivate because I said, oh, I can watch some NFL on Sunday afternoon in this chair. And, and it had this beautiful, it was, you know, it reclined. It was awesome. And so I took it home and I put it in the living room. And when Gina came in, I was going to show it to her. You know what she said? She said, what is that piece of junk in my living room? And I said, honey, this is my recliner. This is my man recliner. And I hopped in there and popped my feet up, you know, and I showed her. And she was like, well, first of all, that's the ugliest thing I've ever seen before. And second of all, it doesn't match everything else in the living room. So we cannot put it here. And I'm like, honey, you don't understand. i I got to have a place to watch television. All that to say, it quickly ended up in the basement. <laughs> men and women are different. How do men, how do women who are totally different get on the same page? We have to walk with God. Listen. When you walk with God, God will bring opposite people together to be about the same purpose and plan that he has. But when God is not in the equation, it's really difficult to bring him and her and bring them on to the same page. When you walk with God, it will build a foundation. You will have a common denominator. You will have a connection and a bond that you will not have otherwise. We have to walk with God. And Enoch understood it for 300 years. When you walk with God, you'll have direction. When you walk with God, you'll have provision. You'll you'll, you'll have God's blessings. When you walk with God, you'll have wisdom. So Enoch walked with God, but he also believed God. And check this out. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. And now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. But look back at those first two words, by faith. You have to believe God. You have to believe God. If you're going to have consistency, you've got to be a man of faith. You've got to be a woman of faith. And believing God will breed consistency in your life. The reason so many people are on today and gone tomorrow is because they have a teeny tiny little faith. And when one problem comes up, people go off the rails. Listen, when you learn to believe God, you will get up, you will keep fighting, you will keep praying, you will keep believing, you will keep doing whatever God has put before you even when you don't feel like it because your faith is in the Lord. Your confidence is in God. And so the spring in your step is not just because you're a happy person or just because you listen to a self-help tape. It's because, it's because why? It's because you have faith in the Lord. You have faith in the Lord. And Enoch believed God. He believed God. Listen, you don't have one problem today that your faith cannot solve. Guilt, maybe you did something wrong. And you feel bad about it? Listen, God can forgive your sin. Your faith can change your guilt. A stress. We worry. We think this problem is too big. And worry is faith turned inside out. So if you're stressed, strengthen your faith. If you're angry, remember that God is the one who settles the score. God's going to fix that situation. I don't, have to, I don't have to get vengeance on that person. God will take care of all that. I trust in God. My faith is in God. Therefore, I can relax. I don't have to do, do this all on my own. Uh, our faith co- uh, overcomes our fear. So faith is a great weapon for wherever our struggles are, but we have to believe God. How could I be consistent? i, I got to trust in God. Sometimes we take the mystery out of our spiritual experience. Listen, if you're going to live by faith, you're going to have tons of uncertainty. There's going to be many, many times and situations you're like, I'm not really sure what I'm doing. 
But you know what? I know that God has a plan. And I want to do what God has said to do, even if it's not completely logical to me. Even if I don't have it all dialed in and all articulated and perfectly organized and put together. I, I, I'm believing God. I, I, I'm walking with God. I, I got confidence that God knows what I don't know. And because God knows and I trust God, I'm okay with not having all of the answers. I'm living by faith. See, God is, a, is an amazing God. And walking with God is an adventure. It's not a disappointment. And when you believe God, you'll do great things. My kids went to basketball camp uh, recently, a couple weeks ago. And I said, how was camp? And I was all excited because I love to put my kids in basketball. And, and uh, my boys said, Dad, we already knew all the drills. I didn't learn anything, you know. It's like... It was boring, you know. It stunk. And I'm like, well, son, the reason that they have you do the same drills over and over again is not so you can check the box and say that you know how to dribble between the cones and shoot a layup. The purpose of doing the same drill over and over again is so that you perfect it, right? It's so that you can dribble faster, so that you can jump higher, so that you can get the right footwork and, 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 and you, can, you can play defense and you can be positioned in the right place. And every time you do the drill, you get just a little bit better at what you're doing. So it's not just that I learned the drill. I wonder how many times in the life of faith we feel like we're doing the same drills over and over and again. But God is teaching us, he's fine-tuning, he's sharpening our abilities to live by faith. And sometimes the monotony of being in the same place and facing the same adversity and, and dealing with the same heartache is so frustrating. But know this, that when you live by faith, God is taking you places and you have to run the drill over and over again until God says you're ready to do something different. By faith, Enoch lived. He lived by faith. And so we have to believe God. We have to walk with God. But we also have to do a third thing, and that is we have to share God. Now, if you go to the book of Jude, verses 14 and 15, there's only one chapter in the book of Jude. This is what the book of Jude in the New Testament tells us about Enoch. Now, Enoch lived seven generations after Adam, and he prophesied about these people, and he said, Look, the Lord is coming with thousands of his holy ones, and he will bring the people of the world to judgment, and he will convict the ungodly of all the evil things that they have done in rebellion and all the insults that godless sinners have spoken against him. Jude is sharing the message of salvation with his hearers. Jude is talking about God, or excuse me, Enoch in the book of Jude is sharing God's redemptive plan for humanity. He's talking about the Lord. Listen, when you walk with God and you believe God, you cannot help but talk about God. And the reason that sometimes it's so difficult for us to talk about God is because sometimes there's things in our lives that are inconsistencies, and those inconsistencies make us uncomfortable talking about God. But listen, when you walk with God and you live by faith, you can't help but talk about God. And when you walk with God and you live by faith, people will come and ask you, Hey, I got this problem. I don't know what you're a person of faith. You're spiritual. You're a Christian. Hey, man, can you, can you share with me a little bit about this? Because I don't know what to do. Or people will say to you, hey, there's something different in your life. What church do you go to? What, 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 what time are Sunday services? Could I get a little of that? Would that rub off on me if I showed up on Sunday morning over at Edge Church? People will come and ask you. See, sometimes we worry so much about sharing a formula or having a script. I'm going to say this to tell people about Jesus and God and the Bible and all that. And there's a place for some of that. But listen, it ultimately has to flow out of our life. If we live this kind of life, then we're never going to talk this kind of language. But if we have our life dialed in in faith then we're just sharing with people. Like, hey, what did people say, well, what did you do this weekend? Oh, I went to church, you know? Uh, I learned about living by faith. Really, you know? Instead of talking about what you did on Saturday, talk about what you did on Sunday, you know? 
What are your kids involved in? Oh, they, they, they went to camp with the, with the youth group over at the church, and, and they, they, they were at the Wild Week, you know, with the kids' ministry, and, and, and I serve over there. Oh, really? Yeah. We ought to just be talking more about the life of faith. We ought to be sharing more about what God is doing in our lives, and when that happens, God will open doors. When we started our very first church in another state several years ago, Gina and I, Lived on a street. I did an un- informal survey. There were about 30 homes on our street, and I only found two families that were consistent in going to a Christian church. And I was like, this is opportunity. <laughs> and so we just started building relationships. We started connecting with people. We, we just started, you know, talking in the yard, and, and I started playing basketball with the neighbors, and we just started hanging out and talking. Well, you know, over the period of the next few years, we had about you know, four, five, six of those families coming to the church. Several of them committed their lives to Christ. And it was awesome. I remember this lady named Holly that lived across the street. And, and uh, one afternoon I had an opportunity just standing out in the yard to lead her to Christ and her older daughter. And it wasn't something that was particularly like rehearsed or set up. It just, it just came up, right? It, it just was part of the journey of faith. It was part of the conversation. It was part of what God was doing. Listen, when you live by faith, God will give you divine conversations. When you trust God and you walk with God, God will open doors of opportunity to impact people that you would not have otherwise. We have to walk with God. we got to live by faith. Finally, in the life of Enoch, we see that Enoch pleased God. I mean, if you look there in the end of verse 5, it says... Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having, say it with me, pleased God, right? I mean, is there anything greater that could be said about your life? He pleased God. She pleased God. Wow. Enoch pleased God. He pleased God. And you know what? When you love somebody, you want to please them. Is that the truth? Yeah, I think so. I love my wife. I want to please her. One of the things I love to do is I love to do some little household chores. She loves that, by the way. I used to be a trash guy. I was always taking the trash out. But my little boy got big enough that he could now take the trash out. So I was able to pass that responsibility off. I've got this figured out. If you don't want to do as many household chores, just have more children, right? If you procreate, you have a little workforce in the home. Works really great. And now my daughter, she's getting big enough to put the dishes away because I've been like the, you know, Gina kind of puts the dishes in the dishwasher and then I put them away. But I'm, I'm giving that to my daughter, you know, praise God, and I'm passing that off. So, so, so kids are great for chores. Kids are great for little extra labor around the house. That's a good thing. But when you love somebody, you want to serve them, right? <clears throat> you want to help them. And when we love God, we want to serve God. We want to please God. We want to live a lifestyle that pleases God. I want to encourage somebody today. Listen, you're walking with God, and you're walking with God, and it's pleasing to God. Sometimes when you're walking with the Lord, you know, it kind of feels monotonous, and you get weary and tired in the journey, and you forget something. Remember this, you're pleasing God. When God looks down on your life out of heaven, he's like, man, she's got it dialed in today. I am so proud of her. And I can't believe them. That is off the hook, what what he's doing and what they're doing. And it just pleases God. This last week, we were at student camp um, up in the mountains. And some of the kids said, Pastor, we want to go hiking. And we need an adult to go. And I was like, all right, I'll hike. You know, I'm like, I'm a Colorado guy. I've been here 10 years. I'm a hiker. Now, I've never been hiking before. Never been on one hike. I'm like, I'm a hiker. Man, the incline of this mountain that we were, it was vicious. I was having visions of riding the gondola to the top. I mean, (laughs) midway through. But I couldn't quit because I had this whole group of kids that were with me. You know? And I feel like my heart's going to explode out of my chest. I'm like, I cannot take another step. It was... It was brutal, brutal. But you know what? We did get to the top. And when we got to the top of the mountain, it was an amazing view. It was worth it. I was taking selfies all over the place. It was fantastic. It was awesome. The valleys, the peaks, 
the sun, the trees, the river. It was off the hook. It was totally worth it. Now, I like hiking downhill better than I like going uphill. Going downhill was much more enjoyable. But, you know, as you think about your life, and as we think about our lives, most of the time, the life of faith is like climbing a mountain. Most of my life, I have felt like I'm climbing uphill. I've had a few seasons where I've maybe been on the downhill. But most of the time, it's an uphill climb. And you get weary, and you get tired, and you get frustrated, and you have good days and bad days. But when you get to the top, when you get to the place that God has called you to go, it's all worth it. It's all worth it. And Enoch's life pleased God. What's God going to say about your life at the day of judgment? He pleased God. He walked with God. She was consistent. She was on the mark. She was someone I could always depend on. It pleased me. It pleased me. That's what God wants to say about us. That's what God wants to say about us. So how's your walk today? How's your walk? We please God not by being perfect, by being, but by being consistent. Being consistent. No, no one's perfect. To walk with God doesn't mean moral perfection. What it means is when you fall down and skin your knee, you get up and you keep walking. That's what it means to walk with God. God wants you. God wants me. God wants us to have a dynamic walk with Him that is not shaken by the time of day or by the circumstance or the season of life, but one that is dialed in in faith and keeps us moving forward and doing the will of God. And that's why we're here today. Would you bow with me for just a moment of prayer?